Hello, and welcome to the Paul Mellon Center. We have a few latecomers. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> and, um, so this is the first uh, research seminar we have this term, and I'm very, very pleased uh, to welcome Christopher Cowell. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction uh, to Christopher and then hand over. Um, Christopher Cowell studied architectural history at Columbia University. He's taught worldwide, including in Hong Kong, New York, and more recently in Dublin, where he was assistant professor of modern and contemporary architectural history at Trinity College, Dublin. He now lectures in architectural history and theory at London South Bank University, so close by. Um, his long-standing historical research focuses on both southern China and northern India, uh, exploring the entanglement of modernity within imperial, uh, European imperialism and its participation in architecture and urbanism. Christopher's writing examines the relationship between the practice and theory of urbanism. Um, against the cultural complexity of colonialism. So he's the author of, can I show the book? Um, or maybe Christopher will show you afterwards. Uh, he is the author of Form Follows Fever, Malaria and the Construction of Hong Kong, 1841 to 1849. And um, we'll hear bits and pieces of research from the book um, as well today. So the talk is titled Maps, Malaria and the Visual Construction of Early Hong Kong. Over to Christopher, and just to say that we'll have time for Q&A, so um, yeah, there's plenty of time for us to talk to each other in this room and then also at a reception next door afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, Shreya, for that lovely introduction. Um, I've got to take out a cough suite while I'm talking because I thought it would be finished by now. Not very pleasant, but... There we go, because um, I had a terrible cough and it's now receding. Um, so um, thank you everyone for coming and your generous uh, attendance here today to hear this talk. Um, it's It comes on the back of a book launch that I gave a week ago at the AA um, and I've been ever present in my mind how to give a talk that's the similar but not the same, um, that, that covers the same kinds of ground, but in a, in a way that's uniquely perhaps suited to the spirit of the Paul Mellon uh, um, um, Centre. Uh, and I thought that I would try to think of this from the point of view emphatically on the visual evidence that I have gathered to produce this book and think of the genres of that evidence, dividing it into three portions. Uh, so I'll be talking about maps, and then I'll be talking about the construction drawings of Hong Kong or drawings pertaining to construction of Hong Kong in all its uh, aspects, both the physical construction and the ideological construction. And then the third part will be a focus on the paintings of Hong Kong, particularly to the idea of how the paintings can spatially position us, think about the the ideas of the landscape and ecology and urbanism of Hong Kong. So um, it's a kind of strange kind of artificial separation taxonomy that I thought might be interesting, reveal interesting kind of narratives that perhaps don't follow the book particularly strongly as a thread, but within themselves talk to each other and then in turn talk across each other as registers and perhaps conversations can emerge out of that approach. But the first little bit will be linked to the introduction of the book as a sequence of images, and I'll, I'll start there. Um, so next slide. So that's the cover of the book that Shreya was going to show you. Um, and I'll also, so uh, I'll explain about the book in, in basic sense. It is, to sort of quote the blurb, the first in-depth account of the turbulent years of initial urban settlement and growth of colonial Hong Kong across the 1840s. And during this period, the island gained a terrible reputation as a diseased and deadly location. Malaria, then perceived as a mysterious vapor or miasma, intermittently carried off settlers by the hundreds, and various attempts to arrest its effects acted as a catalyst, reconfiguring both the city's physical and political landscape, though not necessarily for the better. Now, caught in a frenzy to rebuild the city in the devastating aftermath, the book charts the complex interplay between a cast of figures 
from military surveyors, naval doctors, Indian sepoy, and corrupt and paranoid officials to opium traders, arsonists, Chinese comprador, contractors, and sojourner architects and artists. However, Hong Kong's construction, which is in the second part of the title, was not just physical, but also imagined. Architecture, cartography, epidemiology, and urban infrastructure offer a critical forensic lens through which to examine the shifting ideologies of public health and space, race and placemaking, and commerce and politics, all set against the radical alteration of the settlement from shore-hugging to climbing city, in response to miasma theory, a pre-bacteriological belief in gaseous emanations from a sickly environment. Um, so it's a sort of kaleidoscopic study and it draws on a multitude of evidence, published and unpublished, um, and we'll go, I'll go across this in the talk today. Um, so what I wanted to show uh, is the cover itself as a starting point. It's an image from an unknown Chinese artist uh, of a genre known as the China trade painting. And it's of the Kowloon Peninsula looking back to, the Hong, to Hong Kong Island, which was then the only portion of land that the British um, actually had a treaty to colonize at the time, uh, the Treaty of Chen Pui. And they built, and then Nanking, and they built along the northern edge of Hong Kong Island. And this is on Chinese territory at the time, looking back onto the island. And um, I wanted to emphasize, uh, and I mention it in the book, how one can read, whether it's a willful reading or not, the kind of colors, saturation, and densities in this image at the very year that the worst outbreak of malaria was happening and killing the population with a sort of, I call it a, a sort of bilish green in the foreground, so moldy blues of the mountains behind and a jaundiced sky above. And this is the pullout map at the back of the book. And um, it is the 1843 uh, um, land survey uh, for property um, ownership determination a sort of doomsday book of Hong Kong, early doomsday book of Hong Kong. And we see here that this is the full length of the settlement from that moment, two years after colonization. It's just along a short portion, around two miles in length of the northern edge of Hong Kong Island, the season that Victoria Harbour's on the north of this. Uh, and the, the, the mountains are coming upwards to the south uh, of this image. Uh, and many of the um, points I'm showing here are mentioned they're all mentioned in the book somewhere um now um part of the interest of this project uh was how does uh how does one build a colony how, how does one start it's it's kind of a rare thing for a historian to actually start to study this and try to understand all the components that make up um a city from seemingly a tabula rasa now obviously that's a colonial conceit because there were Chinese settlements in the south of the island. 2,000 Chinese were living in the south. The north was relatively uninhabited, but not uninhabited. There were Hakka living in an area called Wong Nai Chung, which is the Happy Valley. Uh, and there were uh, abandoned paddy and stone quarries dotting the northern edges of the island. And so the British did tap into an existing um, social network of some kind that was there and were building upon existing uh, abandoned uh, surfaces and levels. So it wasn't all simply a tabula rasa. Um, the other the thesis of Hong Kong, uh, the claim of Hong Kong was that it was a barren rock, uh, according to one particular um, 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 member, Palmerston, I think it was, who said this in London. And this again was a sort of trope to justify colonization, um, but there was indeed um, uh, deforestation of the land. It was fairly uh, scrubby. Uh, in other words, there were fern, but almost no trees on the north side of the island to start with. Um, so, uh, and then here is an image showing modern Hong Kong against this edge line, and we can see, um, uh, I haven't drawn a red line, but I should, probably should have, but the, the, the edge of the coastal edge then is far back inward than the edge we see today, uh, dramatically so, uh, 
rampant reclamation has occurred over the hundred, nearly um, 160 plus years of Hong Kong's colonization at the, uh, since then. Now, um, the book starts off with the one and only photograph uh, that, that um, to just amplify the fact that there was no, uh, that we have no photographic evidence of the first decade of Hong Kong's colonization across the 1840s. Um, we do have this, these lovely um, plates, gelatine plates of John Thompson from the 1660s and 70s, uh, who uh, famously uh, uh, photographed um, did anthropological studies of Chinese peoples within mainland China at that time. He lived in Hong Kong and uh, recalls to say this, this quote, I won't bother reading it, but this, this miraculous transformation as the settlers of Hong Kong saw it by the, 18, by the 1860s and 70s, that Hong Kong had been this dangerous, noxious place that almost um, failed. And that uh, 25 years later, a splendid town with all these arcades, colonnades, and, and sort of Grecian looking city with, with um, arc, arch, uh, sorry, arcades and, and, and trabiated, which would, which would mean um, non-arched, Grecian-like uh, layers on top, palaces on top of go-downs, warehouses, and go marching along the shoreline and up the hills. This was an extraordinary vision that that no one had thought would be possible in the 1840s. Um, another thing about the the image imagery of Hong Kong is that the book pertains to this idea that Hong Kong. Um, um, the, in, by 1843, two years after colonization, Hong Kong was hit by the worst outbreak of malaria uh, at the time, and it was called the Hong Kong fever. Now, the particular issue here in the book is that we don't know quite what the disease was from a modern perspective. The name malaria or malaria means bad air, malus aria, and it was thought of as a gas um, up until about the 1870s when germ theory starts to take off, particularly from veterinary medicine. And so um, no one knew that the, that the mosquito was the vector of the of plasmodium, the Anopheles mosquito. Um, and so no one knew that the mosquito was the cause of malaria. They thought it was coming from either the air or from marshes and gases from the ground. And in fact, different miasmas had different names and malaria was also known as marsh miasma because they did have deep insights into the causalities or the or the re areas in which disease was occurring and they determined that indeed and correctly so that malaria emanated from standing water and so um one of the one of the key aims and and fears of hong kong is that hong kong's geology hong kong's construction hong kong's landscape held in itself basins of water hidden basins visible basins that needed eradicating and that it was the constructing of hong kong that was a cause of death um and we see here an image by francis dunby the upper or poison tree of java which was his um uh painting that got him into the royal academy as a member uh, in the 1820 and we see this thin spike in the background and skeletal remains of humans in the foreground and a rather pale looking figure, presumably a European in the foreground, uh, shielding their face away from this toxic landscape. And it was seen as almost ap apocalyptic, biblical, such as John Martin's paintings at the time. So it's got this kind of, uh, it's exuding this dark um, evil from, from as found in the landscape. And one of the things that uh, struck me was um, reading the adver advertisements of Hong Kong at the time. This was actually thought to be a real place, a real location in which uh, the white European was not permitted to enter. And this was published in the Hong Kong newsprint in the 40s during the times of the worst outbreak of sickness. And the locals were actually thinking about this seriously and wondering if Hong Kong Island was similar, similar to this Javanese um, uh, toxic landscape. And so I want to just impress upon people how um, found landscapes were considered to be, uh, had the potentiality of, of um, death. 
and um, and the question was, could the city overcome the inherent maladies of Hong Kong's landscape? These were the questions that were being asked at the time. Um, this map uh, is an example of cartography I'll touch upon in later, but it's a map of 1845, the billeting map of Hong Kong, and it shows these deep ravines and ridges and the fears that exuded in these declivities, the, the valley parts, and how um, the um, colonists were thinking of building on the ridges. And so we end up having the um, three layers of power of colonialism, the British colonialism in Hong Kong Island, which is on the left, the army in Can on Cantonment Hill. Uh, in the middle, we have the government of Government Hill, and on the right, we have the magistracy and the law courts and the, and the prison in Magistracy Hill. And now those three centers are still with us. The lingering legacies are still with us on Hong Kong. But of course, the declivities have been filled in, so we don't notice that these ridges were quite undulating at first. And so the coastal carriageway road to the south, the Queen's Road, was the only bit of level ground. And then everything else went up in these ridge spines and so the city had to grow like fingers on this. And nullas, which are waterways, ran down the, the ridges and gathered in pools. And so there was a sense of terrains of fear against terrains of optimism. And so um, they can be inscribed in maps at the time graphically. And also, Hong Kong was seen by others as a process rather than a, as a place. We see here John Uktaloni, who was uh, the chief engineer of Hong Kong for a while. And uh, oddly enough, in his frontispiece to the Chinese War, the only image he has in his book of Hong Kong, um, he he draws these rather naively orientated buildings and buildings in the wrong positions and go-downs in the wrong orientation, all that, in the wrong scale. And But the point being is that one gets a sense that Hong Kong is being made of parts, of types, of typologies in certain locations and not in others. Um, and Hong Kong itself, for those who don't know the history of it across the 19th century, was acquired by the, um, the British in three phases. The first was in 1842 with the Treaty of Nanking, which gets them the island itself, and that's theirs in the darkest blue. And then in 1860, the Treaty of Peking, or Beijing, uh, took Kowloon, uh, both in perpetuity, at gunpoint, you could say, gunboat diplomacy, and then in 1898, under a, a, a properly a more equitable, if you can call it that, treaty, um, they, the second convention of Peking, they took the rest of the new territories, the outlying islands, Lama, Lantau, and various other islands, uh, for, 90, for a 99-year lease, which is why Hong Kong was handed back in 1997 in, in its entirety. I won't go into the details, but it was impossible for the British to hold on to the other two portions. So that's the reason for the handover. And, and it's also the reason why this uh, talk will focus just on the dark blue bit, the Hong Kong Island, which is all that the British had at that point. Um, now, the book is divided into six chapters, with the including the introduction. The other five are here, shown diagrammatically in terms of a... T a, a um, the, the time frame chronology. Um, and I thought that it would be uh, the best way to explain the narrative of the story is to show how malaria keeps reappearing as a sort of teaching, harsh teacher. And each time the city, the city and the people of the city start to react to it and rebuild according to the latest thesis as to what's causing the deaths. And so I found that really fascinating. Um, how um, the the testing of what they saw as this miasma was affecting the way they considered uh, constructing Hong Kong. At first, they thought of it more regionally, and then as the years went on, they started to think of it more site-specifically. And then eventually, by the 1843, they start to really particularly start to think about it architecturally and think of the construction issues that could save them against others but in fact, no one fully agreed as to what was causing it. And all three, location, atmosphere, 
geology and 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 look and uh, architecture played um varying roles of influence on the various actors of the development of hong kong and here are the subheadings sub chapters in the book um and we move from sort of general sense of the components that make hong kong in the first two years to the um big interruption of this, of, the, of this second chapter where the fever starts to kill dramatically and um, burst, the people of Hong Kong start to, um, the a chaos ensues and they start to re-question the very fundaments of the settlement. And then the third and, the third and fourth chapters you see are vertically arranged uh, at the same time and start to develop, um, um, the, the, as the dust settles, if you like, various uh, actors on the island start to see their chance of opportunity of grabbing power which is grabbing space on the terrain and there becomes this strong uh, sense of um of, of of brinkmanship going on as they as different people military against civilian government against merchants against chinese start to vie with space and the uh, city gets redeveloped redesigned quite dramatically uh, this is a history that very few people actually know about, but obviously with the book they, they know now. So, and then the last chapter uh, is a miniature study of how the, the techniques that were learnt uh, across uh, a much more wider expanse start to concentrate down into just a set of rooms in a barracks building, a set of two barracks, the most lavish and expensive buildings yet produced in Hong Kong. And ironically, the site of a third outbreak of terrible malaria, but just concentrated within these buildings. And so if you like the kind of phobias and fears, the, path, the uh, pathology of fear of an island is condensed into a set of buildings. And I found that fascinating and um, a chance discovery at Kew, in fact, caused this chapter and uh, the, the National Archives. And, um, and the, the, the idea of the use of statistical data and measurement start to play a, a, a stronger role than they did it did prior. So the talk, uh, the remainder of the talk, um, I'm going to talk very quickly about the components of Hong Kong. And um, I'm going to divide it, as I say, into three genres and to see how they play out. Now, <clears throat> Much of the material used in the book comprises of primary sources, uh, and they include medical reports and central government reports, personal diaries, published newspapers, journal accounts, advertisements, and the like. And so visual material plays a very intrinsic role in this. And also it reveals settlers' ideological, perceptual, and even psychospatial anxieties. Um, now, to start with, of course, the first maps of Hong Kong have to be naval, uh, in, from the European point of view, that is. I haven't yet found Chinese maps of Hong Kong. That would be amazing if, if we can find pre-colonial Chinese maps. But the earliest maps are Portuguese and English. And here we have Alexander Dalrymple's charts of the South China Sea from the late 18th century, the famous charts. And the map, the area we see of Hong Kong, I don't know if this is a digital pointer, is it? Yes, it is. Brilliant. Yes. Fantastic. So, um, Fan Chin Chow doesn't show on okay. glass. <laughs> glass. Okay, well, if what you see on the far right, Fan Chin Chow, is, is what we now call Hong Kong. And um, you notice that there's something missing, which is the top right-hand side, the deep water harbour of Hong Kong, uh, Victoria Harbour, which was um, the real reason why the British wanted to be on the north side of the island not the better, as the Chinese locals saw it, the south side of the island, because it had deep, unusually deep soundings for ships. And it, it was used prior to the Opium War, First Opium War, as a, a typhoon shelter by, the, by Europeans. And it was a dumping ground, an illegal dumping ground of opium and cotton. So Hong Kong was always this, it was in the sort of sights of the British, but even before the so-called First Opium War of 1838, um, um, 39 to 42, 43. Now, um, 
what uh, Dalrymple does is he starts, he discovers Felis Mendoza's earlier chart, who had earlier gone through the, the straits and had discovered the soundings. Uh, and then this leads, that's the gap between Kowloon and Hong Kong, the very first drawing we think we have, at least based on Mendoza. And then we get to Ross and Morn's map of Hong Kong, which is the most accurate, fullest shape we have to date from 1810 with all the soundings. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is the Hong Kong, the Red River character written in Chinese underneath the words, because I want to um, uh, propose a hypothesis, a strong hypothesis, which I write in the book, which is that I think Hong Kong was a made up name. It is a made up name by the British for the island based upon a misunderstanding, a mishearing of the words. Um, so they, they would ask the local, the Hong Kong itself proper was the Hong Kong um, Bay, Hong Kong was the bay on the southwest corner of the island, which is now called Hong Kong Zai, Little Hong Kong. And Up Lei Zhao is just below that. And then there's a waterfall near Aberdeen where they took their boats and they filled up with water. And they asked the locals, where are we? Uh, uh, um, and they said, uh, so Hong Kong was here. And they thought, well, here's Hong Kong. And they talked to a map maker and they said, oh, the, this is Hong Kong. And they said it probably said it the wrong way. And so it said Red River, not, fra not Fragrant Harbor. And so we know from the right miswriting that the name was extrapolated, heard orally and put back into writing by a Chinese not knowing the name, not hearing it in the dialect, or maybe themselves not have, sharing the same dialect for the British. And so Hong Kong is clearly an extended, extrapolated and invented name for the island. Uh, and here's the first map we have as a full map from 1841, the Belcher map, the famous Belcher map, Captain Sir Edward Belcher in HMS Sulphur. And note the uh, the um, this is the first iteration, there's a second, third iteration. But I just want to focus in on the graphic of the island, which will play a role in this discussion. This sort of pockmarked lunar landscape of an etching, because as yet the technique of contour line drawing hasn't really taken off in published map making. Now, the contour line did exist from the late 18th century, a, ma a mountain in Scotland famously was the first ever drawing, we think, manuscript drawing using the contour line, then gets taken by the French for their military installations, again, in manuscript form. But the first ever full-scale study attempt to do contour lines across a, an entire geography, geographic survey, was the survey of Ireland, starting in the 1830s. And from that, a young man called Thomas Bernard Collinson comes to Hong Kong, and he's asked very quickly to do a contour map of the island, and I'll come to that in a moment. But here we see the concepts of terrain and height and valleys being of great importance, even to a naval uh, hydrographer. Uh, and the graphic is, one can read into this, uh, that 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 heights and shadows and declivities are of an importance, and they become a greater importance, of course, once the settlers start to um, disperse across the northern edge of the island. We also see a concentration, an etching done of the peninsula, the Tim Tsui, which is the sort of beak-necked mouth, like a like a snake's mouth. It was described as tongue, snake's tongue, coming over to. Uh, uh, form this sort of sinusoidal bend, which is Victoria Harbour, and Stonecutters Island to the left. Now, of course, completely reclaimed. Um, but but that the graphic sh reveals an interest by Belcher very early to consider the Kowloon Peninsula as part of this colonizing yeah. process, even though they don't have it. And the haunting of the Kowloon Peninsula is something that's, I think, of interest. Um, we have here these, this is the very first iteration of the Belcher map of 1841, which reveals the very first mapped surface uh, that shows the layout of the British settlement 
1841, very early before the town is built. And we notice possession point up in the top left, uh, which is still uh, is still known, marked by a garden and possession street in Sai in in, in Sai Inpun, Xiongwan area of Hong Kong. And uh, down from it are these little tents we see down saying British settlement. And then we see road cut by the engineers. Now, one of the things we learned from textual sources is that the British start to put their tents, the army start to put their tents in the January of 1841, when they plant the flag, precisely because the lee of the northwest monsoon winds happens to be protecting, protected by Tim Tao Chui to the north. So it acts as a kind of calming corridor. So the tents can't be pitched either side of this. So they happen to just pitch it there. And so uh, one argument you can play, uh, I mean, it is a hypothesis, but it, I think it's a strong one, is that central, the center of Hong Kong was um, determined by the happenstance of the lee of the Kowloon Peninsula during a northwesterly mon uh, monsoon wind corridor, which becomes extraordinary and ridiculous in some ways, but that becomes the debate because Belcher himself wanted to take um, Happy Valley to the right as the center of the city, which had the only natural piece of level ground pertaining to that northern edge. And he said it made much more sense. It could defend itself. It was right opposite the Kowloon Peninsula. It just it had these prongs of land coming out which you could put guns on. So it made the city very defensible. And it made a lot of sense to a, man, a military man like Belcher. But, um, but it was so difficult to pull the gravity of the city across. But we'll see in the very first years, just before the worst malaria outbreak, that the city did indeed, that the, the government did indeed intend to move the capital across to this other area and malaria nipped it in the bud. So here we have the very first drawing we know of, of Hong Kong as it's settled with the tents seeing against the, the map. I'll be doing more of this imagery uh, later, but I just wanted to show that, share that. We also have the Happy Valley I just mentioned. Here's the bit of level ground we see at the back is the Hakka uh, village of Wong Nai Chong. And we see on the plan, the first government map of Hong Kong, the Pottinger map of 1842. Um, um, we see this, uh, the first plan we know of, of this area of the valley. And you see the myriad of network crisscrossing marshy uh, uh, rivulets of water which then starts to um, become a locus of sickness for the for the hong kong people uh, early on and therefore that it's dubbed happy valley as a sort of euphemism um, when it is a very unhappy valley in fact um, so this is the first map of 1842 pottinger map at q rolled out we see this very naively drawn, and interestingly, it's drawn from the position of the water looking to the, to the land in a very unconventional way, placing north southwards on the map, north downwards, I mean. And so um, um, one of the inferences from this, and we know this from drawings, is that most of the population was living on water at this point as the survey was being drawn. And so it suggests a kind of pers perspective emphasis of how the city is visually imagined from the water looking onto it uh, and i thought that was an interesting way notice that notice also the color coding um uh, the the new build in brown and um red is i think red is a commercial and brown is 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 civilian and also red is government um the next map i want to move on to is the 1843 um Edwards de Havilland survey, also known as the Gordon's map. And um, two, two uh, uh, army officers, Edwards and de Havilland, produced this under Gordon to as a kind of um, decision to, to, to decide who owned what, where, because there was an awful lot of chaos between the two land sales of 1841 and 1844. And in between that time, the government ordered the cessation of all building. In other words, because the treaty hadn't been ratified until 1843, uh, um, Henry Pottinger, the first governor, decided that he wanted no one to build because of the uncertainty. But what happened was, apart from the headache that was caused economically, because the covenants of land were 
had imposed the requirement to build within a certain time or the land would be forfeited. There were four, uh, the other problem was large empty plots were forming giant swimming pools of water everywhere all along the edges of the island, which I think was um, a perfect cause of mosquito breeding. It was a field day for the Anopheles mosquito. And so we have uh, what we see here, a snapshot of a start of an urban grain growing, the very strong upwards trend of the um, upper bazaar, the Chinese layer, and the, and the Chinese lower bazaar. These are the two strong urban components, whereas the Europeans are building very disparately in these little enclaves everywhere. And I found that very interesting, the, the, urban, the urban language that is forming along the Queen's carriageway, the Queen's Road. And the marine lots in the blue, which uh, the government mistakenly didn't impose dis restrictions on distance of reclamation outwards. So they started reclaiming furiously upon their plots. Uh, the, the town lots that followed the Queen's carriageway to the south uh, of the road, and then the suburban lots were all these extraordinary buildings built without any linkages to the city higher up, which were the cheapest lots, uh, sort of free for all. Uh, uh, was formed. And if we overlay this, we see uh, the modern grain of Hong Kong against these plots uh, and the echoes of it within the street formations. Obviously, much of it's still intact in terms of the grain, but you can see to the north a lawful lot of reclamation since that time. Um, the magistrate's prison is on the at the bottom, which becomes the major compound of Hong Kong built by William Kane and his uh, acolytes, you could say. He was a very harsh man. Um, he was judge, jailer, and jury uh, for much of the time at the beginning. And uh, for the Chinese, he seemed to be the, famous, the, the, the big chief in, and not the governor. He was the most visible power of, of colonial, colonialism at the time. Um, I thought it very interesting to look at uh, how the map reveals legacies. Um, this is a study of West Point Barracks, which is known to have been the starting point of the Hong Kong fever of 1843, the, 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 a major source of, of the sickness. And um, I was curious to overlay it with an ordnance survey. And it revealed to me, because I did read in, in textual sources, that it was built on abandoned paddy fields. And you can see from the modern road system that indeed the barracks sits in three clusters quite neatly between the road layouts and starts to reveal that terracing, which does exist to this day, between Bonham Road and Pok Fulam Road and Third Street, Third Street bending because it was initially the bend of the edge of the coastline. And so uh, one can start to see through um, comparisons um, the traces of the past. And E.J. Eitel, a famous historian of Hong Kong, in the 1890s said that the traces of the abandoned barracks, which were dismantled in 1844, even in the 1890s, grass failed to grow in certain patches around it, forming the traces, the ghost of the barracks. And the, the, the area is known as Sayingpun, which literally means West Military Barracks. Um, and so we see, coming back to that map with the strange terrain, a uh, sort of dyslexia between the safer parts of the city now, as they start to feel they've tamed the center and they're building the grid upwards. They've dislocated the Chinese from Upper Bazaar by 1845. And we start to see harsh terrains that are still of landscape and dangerous to them with tamed terrains where they start to uh, form these um, uh, grids and systems. Some of these, such as Elgin Street, Ile Ganga, is at a diagonal and you see it bending and that road um, is, is used for sedan chair carrying. So the wealthier people start to live in this upper area called mid-levels to escape the gas, presumably, but they also start to see that the healthiest part of Hong Kong was around the magistracy prison. And so there's a sort of a kind of height becomes a valuable commodity. It becomes a selling point for properties. And so we see as an outcome of malaria a climb upwards of the city and a collapsing inwards. Um, and that's one of the consequences that I, I talk about. Uh, the peak in Hong Kong hasn't yet happened until the 1870s, but we see a, a striving for the peak as a consequence in the 1840s. 
Now, this is the map I was mentioning earlier of Collinson, Thomas Bernard Collinson, in his early 20s when he does this. It takes him two years to circumnavigate the island. He, he does the island at night on a boat using candlelight because he tries to avoid the distorting effects of the sun. It's something very similar to the lamplight used in the survey of Ireland. I think it was limelight they used that um, avoided, or I think, may, or maybe in the argon lamp, it, it avoided distorting effects. So much of the surveying of Ireland was done at night. He sets up traverses and stone markers, trig, trig points, as they're called, in stone across the island. And we found one trig point, I think in 2014, in Laimun Park, which revealed uh, this original uh, measuring uh, marker of Collinson. He sleeps by day on a boat and he's pulled around by uh, helpers. And then he, he surveys this. And the reason I'm laboring on this map is it is, uh, to our knowledge, the first published contour map in the world. And it is of Hong Kong. And I think this is of a profound importance because it beats the Survey of Ireland by a year. Constance using the Survey of Ireland techniques, of course. He, he was at the survey. And once this is published, the landscape concepts of Hong Kong shift. We have had the Belcher hydrographic map, and against it, we see the Collinson map. And the, con the sense of terrain, the sense of land, the sense of control changes, quite literally, because the second governor, John Davis, starts to rapidly build a, a circular, circulatory road system around the island based upon the findings of Collinson. Um, there's the four-part map. There's a little bit more in detail. And here we see um, the edge on the right of Pok Fulam Road, which was built to cut through and erase West Point Barracks on the left as a form of exorcism, you could say, and link itself to the city to the north and link across to Hong Kong Zai, the little Hong Kong, where the bay was, where the water was. And it follows the contour precisely. It was built exactly like that, still there to this day, because uh, building that road on the level was the most cost-effective measure. It wouldn't be washed away by typhoons and monsoons. And also, it, um, it allowed a marching army. It was all for security purposes. It would allow a marching army to their various military stations around the island to march more efficiently and quickly on a level. So um, um, it was a, a strategic idea to build and to use the contour system. And we know it from Collinson's diaries that indeed he was employed in road building as a consequence of his mapping. So the map became a way of creating Hong Kong and not just reflecting what was there. To accompany this map, Collinson drew these 10 remarkable outline sketches of the island, included, and the Ordnance Office thought it was so extraordinary that they uh, decided they would, um, as you see on the left, um, send it to other Royal Engineers offices in other countries, such as Mauritius. Now, um, the ordnance map outline sketches uh, are these pictorial, almost like picturesque views around the island with the locations marked sideways with dotted lines going up to point where they are. And so they would form a sort of tapestry of sorts around a key at the front where you could start to have a sort of tour of the island in your armchair. And from those maps, you could then go back to the contour survey and play against the two. And it was quite a radical uh, invention of Collinson to create these as a pair and had an, a profound effect upon uh, um, other royal engineers in the colonies. The other thing I'll end on this map section is that Collinson uh, was a very, very accomplished cartographer. And I think one of the ex most extraordinary maps and most beautiful uh, maps of, of the 1840s is this large study of uh, an area uh, called Cantonment Hill, later Admiralty. And we see here the color coding of various kinds of buildings that are about to be built, have been built, are to be demolished. And on the far left, you see the range of barracks coming up along a spine, which becomes the site of the worst outbreak of malaria in 1848. Uh, ironically, but we start to also see a, a sort of military depot, a military densification, an urban military station 
in all aspects. Uh, the nulla, the Albany nulla, is running through it, which also becomes a, a, a source of, of um, suspicion as they are attacked by malaria. And I've drawn on here on the right, in red, the outline edge roughly of what we see on the map, how far back it is to modern Hong Kong. And the blue is the, the location of nulla now covered by a road and road system, as most nullas are in Hong Kong. Uh, so the second section, and we're running out of time. <laughs> How much time do I have left? Oh, am I? Okay. I'll wrap, well, I'll be wrapping up. I'll wrap up in 10 minutes. I'll do five and five then. Okay. So the construct, construction of Hong Kong, um, I just wanted to show how Hong Kong was on by boat and trade paintings show how storage in, and lumber and foods uh, sources were, were used in, uh, were, were, it was a floating city to start with. I'm fascinated by the typologies of Hong Kong, sort of grey architecture, as Alex Bremner calls it, which has this kind of um, repetitive units of buildings, such as go-downs and warehouses. And, and, and I noticed advertisements. Here you see on the right, one particular man, Gillespie, Charles Gillespie, an American, builds and then rebuilds and then rebuilds the same go down, same warehouses in finer and sturdier material, almost like the story of the three little pigs. And he kind of keeps, because of the, the typhoons, because of arson attacks, it's a very dangerous place, Hong Kong, in the 1840s, very uncertain place. I was just fascinated by the narrative you could do by chaining together episodes and advertisements in newspapers. Um, here is the match shed barracks. Match sheds were a particular structure that the British utilized very early on in Hong Kong. And we see how it's used here for Indian sepoy. Um, and they used it as barracks, as churches, as hospitals, as marketplaces. It was a very versatile, a scaffolding system, very versatile. And I just wanted to mention it also becomes a locus of sickness, a locus of disease, and it becomes much maligned. The very first house of Hong Kong, we have Edward Cree's painting of a Chinese style house for William uh, Kane, the, the magistrate whose little empire, palisaded empire, is behind it under a drawing by George Chinnery. I just wanted to show that because it's it's so interesting. It it lays the it lays the lie that um, or puts pay pay to the lie that the Chinese were very poor constructors uh, and attacks, very racist attacks that European newspapers were doing on how poor they were building. But part of this thing was that they were good builders and they were bad builders, just like anywhere else. Uh, there were idioms of construction that uh, Chinese builders were much more used to. And so we get this very fine building, ridiculously interesting pagoda-like little thing, which was the we think to be the first colonial house on Hong Kong Island. And there's the garden from which a botanical cultivation occurred of Denton Co., uh, which Robert Fortune, the famous um, um, botanist who traveled to China and famously stole tea from China, um, um, infamously, <laughs> um, um, said that this valley had all the fame, all the best types of plants to um, taken from Thomas Beale's garden in Macau, had all the best plants that uh, could be used to reforest Hong Kong. So it becomes the first botanical garden of Hong Kong, a little oasis, if you like, of greenery. Here are the here are the jibes that the British had on in the newspapers of Chinese contract, contractors and builders, arguing about the misalignment of windows and the wrong the wrong um, the, the wrong rhythms, the wrong the, the pediments too triangular, the parapets, the balustrades are on the wrong alignment, and so forth. But I want to compare that with another building done in a Regency style by a great Chinese contractor called Tam Ah Choi. And I talk a lot about the contracting of Hong Kong. I talk about how Hong Kong is built by um, how the Royal Engineers study Hong Kong and how, um, how uh, carrying systems work in Hong Kong, how the tropes of carrying in Hong Kong are mirrored by earlier sources so that even studies of Hong Kong are based upon literature of the past visually, graphically. So Hong Kong is not just constructed physically, but it's constructed um, uh, visually from, from sources outside of that period, um, uh, from, from, if you like, cliches. 
um, and um, binomial nom nomenclature of unit systems of how Hong Kong uh, builders, how Hong Kong uh, con Chinese contractors converse with European overseers through drawings which have both um, uh, Arabic numerals and Chinese units of measurement, which I found very interesting. The conversations of construction through pidgin English, I found very interesting too. So we have these um, rare glimpses of how uh, the, the probably the strongest interactions apart from the comprador system was the contracting system in Hong Kong and how Chinese and, and Europeans engaged with each other through the use of pidgin English. Um, this is the military images of construction and this is the source of miasma of 1848. And I was just fascinated by the remedial measures and the concerns that the British had to prop, to mitigate against malaria, whether it was from the sky and the sun, and therefore they had solar paths that were shaded, or they had emphasizing the drainage systems to make sure that the water was running away through the cookhouses and, and out on, into the sea, and then sketch studies of the orientations of the building, section studies where the latrines are, which believed to be the sources of miasma, and then the, the scales of intervention from putting mosquito and malarial netting on the windows, even though they didn't know that malaria, malaria was caused by the mosquito, by chance they found that ripping off the mosquito nets from the beds, because mosquitoes bit and they were a nuisance, sticking on the windows seemed to calm the, the sickness. And they believed they were sieving the air like a tea strainer and making it more harmless. And they also chunamed the surface of, of the ground. Chunaming comes from Madras, Chennai, uh, with crushed shells, they were taking technologies from India, surfacing ground, polishing it up, which would have been a slip hazard, but it was considered that it was less porous, it was smooth, and would make uh, a much more safer environment for parade grounds and prevent miasmas emanating from around the barracks. But of course, they were in fact preventing stagnant pools of water. Um, so drainage studies... I'm not going to go into this. this is about road building, Western overseers. I've mentioned this um, gang, gang work. I talk a bit about this. I'm fascinated by the development of the typologies of architecture and the kinds of constructions and the, the concerns in advertisements about how to build and where to build. So the last bit I'm just going to touch upon is the painting of Hong Kong. And um, we've seen these images. We've seen the left one. But John Collins painted the right uh, a few weeks later, as the tents start to move across to the Admiralty area, and we get a sense of the mountainscape behind and how precipitous the island was. Just as an, as an example, we see Mount Gough in a modern situation against Mount Gough there. The, the, the one thing we do have to situate these paintings is the profile of the mountain behind the modern city of Hong Kong. The profile is still the same. So as long as John Collins was accurate, and he was pretty accurate as a painter, we know, uh, we can situate the orientation and the views of the island from that. This is Chim Sa Chui. Spolia was taken from the two uh, diffused um, military barracks called dubbed Victoria and Albert, the Chinese camps that were defending Chim Sa Chui, the peninsula, from the British before they took Hong Kong. Then these um, military installations or forts were dismantled by uh, the British and Chinese who scabbled them back and took them at night across by boats, often illegally, and started to reuse the, the granite and the brick as spolia to build Hong Kong, first bits of Hong Kong. So a lot of early Hong Kong was built from dismantled Chinese forts, which I thought was very interesting. And then this very first view we have by Korea medical surgeon looking towards the harbor with these beetle-like banks of boats. The very first image we have, I think, of Hong Kong Island looking back out. And we start to get by mid or early 1841, a reorientation by artists. Instead of being from water looking on, like Collins did, we now get from the island looking back and we start to see the first urbanization through mat sheds and marketplaces. We also get this sense of an intense crowd of people on the island. It is an amazingly vibrant, active, chaotic environment that I want to impress uh, on you. Markets become the earliest typologies of Hong Kong. 
they sit in the declivities, those brownfield areas which were considered dangerous with the nullers and the miasma coming through. And so these marketplaces are, are start to get built. Uh, Singapore frame shop houses, timbers from Manila. The systems are made of wood with brick bases. Uh, they form the first arcades of Hong Kong. They give an impression that becomes the first language of Hong Kong. And I found this particularly interesting. Two competing markets, two competing uh, entrepreneurs are vying with each other along these two images. Uh, uh, they're quite close to each other. Uh, and I think there's, uh, it's a fascinating view of life in Hong Kong. Uh, the slicing of tops of hills, the climb up from 1843 onwards, the, 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 the fight to get higher becomes a thing. And we start to see this. We see the enclaves of Hong Kong, these little satellite places running along. But we also get in this incredible view of Ashworth, um, um, a vista all the way up to the old, the, the central is way in the distance. And then we go around Bend Admiralty in uh, now modern Wan Chai. We're coming through the, the Wong Nai Chung Gap into the Happy Valley below us. Uh, we see the the the, sea, sea, the, uh, the Siemens Hospital is in, in the foreground. We're on Morrison Hill looking across. Um, and these are the enclaves derived from consequences and typologies and pathologies of existence on the 13 factories in Canton. They literally take concepts of the 13 factories, rows of palaces with go-downs at the bottom, gardens at the front, um, walled in, just like we get at the 13 factories. Uh, the first one being uh, Spring Gardens in Wan Chai, Par One as it was called. And we get these sort of enclave mentalities coming up. The, the most wealthiest of the enclave mentalities being Jardine Matheson, East Point One, this wonderful painting. Uh, in the in the Suyan Tang collection, but you get this view to the side where Jardine sits on East Point One in this elevated station, looking down. He has his three three floor office, that easily the largest, biggest building in Hong Kong at the time, which collapsed. Um, and then there's the go downs in front, and it's interesting because in front of him is um, um, Happy Valley, uh, riven with miasma and death. But for some reason, Jardine sitting aloft, just slightly up, was perfectly fine. And this became a marker. Height was clearly the prestigious thing to have, to attain. And uh, it's interesting, one can triangulate. These three images appear in the book of um, uh, East Point from different vantage points at different points in time. And we can start to collate and see how this settlement was grown and uh, how he populated and grew plant, plant, planting on it and protected himself um, from that. So I am fascinated by the collation of image. I'm fascinated by these four rare images we have of the interior worlds of Hong Kong and their types and traumas that are associated with it. From the um, drawings of a royal engineer, this is Collinson, his own uh, drawings and his own, um, his own bungalow to uh, this idea, a fantastical painting by Cree of a single woman, uh, Mrs. Lefoy, who wakes up to find uh, 50 Chinamen, she claims, in her room, and she rushes out and finds the local police, army police, to rescue her and, and comes back and everyone's gone, but have ransacked all her clothing. But we see her sort of vaudevillian, theatrical, fantastical, poorly perspectival image by Cree as he hastily paints this rather a racialized and sexualized image of an interior boudoir, uh, and we see the accoutrements of of an inter of the of furniture around this room, and I found that fascinating. A catalogue I did in eight, in 2014 uh, that uh, revealed a lot of the uh, Edward Ashworth images that had never been seen before, for Horden House in Sydney, which all got bought by the um, Hong Kong Museum of Art, which I was delighted to see, and so I used these images for the first time in the book. And this is a very rare view, three views of a Chinese um, merchant's house, the wealthiest merchant in Hong Kong, Chinam, in central. And we get the outside, the inside and the back painted around the same year. Um, and uh, I go and I explore a lot about the, the, the qualities and ideas behind the viewpoints of Ashworth. Fascinated by the way that Chinese build on the left, uh, stonemasonry by hand, I'm fascinated by the way the Chinese read, often through bill stickers on walls. Um, and uh, we have very little but tantalizing clues about the sensibilities and, and activities of Chinese in Hong Kong and the building of Hong Kong. 
Um, and we get with Ashworth a very rare chance to triangulate a view against Murdoch Bruce's much more well-known um, lithograph of the Queen's Road in Central. Ashworth's new drawing reveal, or newly discovered drawing, reveals the facades of these very wealthy merchant palaces such as Dent and Co in the foreground all the way along. We start to get a sense of the construction and building up of Hong Kong between these two images with a gap of about a year. So um, there we go, the fantastical images of height um, and, and the development of the Grecian palaces, the, the, the Victoria Peak and the climbing up towards the end of the 15, 1840s and started tantalizingly see Hong Kong, uh, sorry, Kowloon in front of us and the desire to get to Kowloon terminates the book. And so the idea at the end of the book, in the last two images, is the uh, illicit reconnaissance picnic uh, that the British make uh, illegally into Chinese territory with the excuse of hunting tiger. So uh, I end there. Thank you very much. Amazing, so many different um, insights uh, and so many visuals as well. I, I think I got a very, I don't know if clear is the right idea, uh, right word, but um, a, a, a very deep sense of uh, looking at Hong Kong from, from the water and from you know d different perspectives, which I think was really helpful especially in creating a, um, a kind of visual sense uh, for the for, for us. What I was curious about and maybe wanted to sort of um, ask you more about is um, the the relationship of malaria really to the city and the spatial politics of the city. Um, because I mean, you, you talked about height, which becomes clearly very important. Um, and then um, mosquito nets, even, even though mosquitoes, you know, the, the connection hadn't been made. Um, so there were bits and pieces here and there, but I was wondering um, if you did move away from maps and the visual, um, were there, what were the other things that you came to that really kind of cements your argument about the, um, the relationship of the spatial politics to the fear of malaria and malaria itself? Uh, if you could maybe speak to some of them. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, wow. Well, it's actually then then I have to then give a talk on the textual material and evidence that yeah, it's just, I mean, kind of, just kind of what, yeah, yeah because of course... A few examples, I think, of yeah, the, um, the most interesting ones. <laughs> um, uh, I would say that, um, the, as I said at the beginning, this idea of how the thesis for what's causing this marsh miasma to kill them, the key thing I want to say is, by the way, the, yeah, the key thing I want to say, by the way, is... Um, that um, malaria or malaria was not considered to be the, what killed you. It weakened your constitution and therefore induced fevers and the fevers killed you. The fevers were the imbalance of your humors. You know, we had the four humors and our bodies in balance and that these external forces, whether they're rays, magnetic rays from the sun or whatever, weaken our constitutions. And, um, what what happens is that I, I used statistics. So, for example, uh, I was very interested in the debates around what was causing this. And one of the arguments I make is that uh, in the past, uh, there's been not a certainty, but there's been a, an assumption that Hong Kong was already a deadly place and the British were stupid to go in the wrong part of the island. And this was an argument that was uh, has been per perpetuated by by writers afterwards that the Chinese were living on the healthy side, the South, and they, the British just, re the abandonment was caused by malaria. We don't know that, but that the British lived, ended up on this darker, gloomier Northern edge and that they had it coming, you know, but, but actually um, I think from statistical analysis, I found that it was in fact the British that brought malaria. They brought it, in the form of their bodies from the China China expedition in Chusan and other area campaigns along the northern edge of the island of mainland China, and so they were they were getting infected, getting malaria, being taken to China, to Hong Kong, which was in fact a hospital depot. West Point was a hospital depot, among others. There were floating ships like HMS Minden, which were used, 
the very first hospital of Hong Kong is a ship. And um, and they they were then taken and decamped on land and put back on ships. And so we know this is kind of fiasco going on where uh, there's not enough su sufficient hospital and attendance for these six soldiers, but that the, in 1842, there is this sudden surge in sickness of the military and that uh, by 1843, it becomes wi wide, uh, universal across the island. And then I think the proof of it comes from the knitting together of the narratives and the statistical evidence and the um, evidence that building had to be stopped. The fact that newspapers were talking about the lamentable fact that there were a lot of these empty pits filling with water. It just, it was, and, and doctors digging up the ground. So another area is that many medical doctors, uh, I think were extraordinary in their capacities to read uh, pathologies, even though they had the different paradigm. So these doctors, for example, were trained as geologists. Uh, at, they they studied the atmosphere. Uh, one doctor was digging up the ground of Hong Kong and found that it was sandy in the middle, and that it was granite on the edges. And there was a thesis that decayed granite. They called it decayed granite was more dangerous. And so where the deaths were was where the granite seemed to be. But where they were living, where the prison was, that particular corridor was more silty and sandy. And so the choice of going upwards in that area I showed you in the building map, it was actually the silty, sandy area that they dug up. So, so the, the locations, the general locations seem to be affected by medical theories of geology. Um, and statistics helped back up uh, sequences of disease and fears of disease and land agreements affected this. So that, that's a few to start with. Yeah, no, that's really helpful also to think about all the many interconnections mm -hmm. that's going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and also just what we get wrong, you know, yeah. and then and sort of keep building on yeah. theories as well. So this is, yeah. 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 Um, Thanks. Uh, I, I know I have m more questions, but I want to open it to the room and also to our online audiences. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box and um, it will magically come to my phone and I will read them out. <laughs> so any questions in the room? Mm -hmm. Hi, Chris. Uh, notice you mentioned the cause of the malaria was discovered a bit later roughly about 50 years later. Yeah. yeah. Would that change um, the way they see the strategic value of the building that comes afterwards in Hong Kong as they discover the cause of the malaria is not from air, it's actually from mosquito? Yeah, uh, this is a great uh, counterfactual in some ways because what, one of the interesting things I, I think about is, is yeah, that, that uh, interestingly enough, we can answer that in some way by looking at what happened after Ronald Ross discovered the Anopheles mosquito had plas the plasmodium in the gut on a Christmas day, or whenever in that island. Um, and interestingly enough, the link with Hong Kong is that Patrick, Sir Patrick Manson was his boss in London and he was wired him with the Eureka note. And so there is a linkage, Ronald Patrick Manson, the first who set up the, the school of, uh, not just the school of tropical medicine, but he also set up, the College of Medicine in Hong Kong, through which Sun Yat-sen was a student. So we have this connection uh, with Hong Kong. Uh, and, and, and after that, there is a even more concerted efforts to, to make sure there's no standing water, to make sure drains are clearly irrigate, irrigations flowing, uh, to make sure all of the... It's funny, not a lot changed in terms of the sense of the pathology of land. And that's why I say that um, a lot of these doctors, even though they're working on me through the paradigm of miasma theory, they're very astute as to the causes of these. I'm in great admiration for many of these doctors of the of the 19th century in a way that because they because they didn't fully know what was going because it, there was a mystery that was unsolved, it forced them to become far more omnivorous in multiple disciplines and connecting them widely in a way that modern Western doctors are quite lazy about, you know? So I'm actually, uh, I'd actually like to overturn this idea that somehow just because we think we know what the paradigm is, it doesn't mean that we're more sophisticated in, uh, in, uh, in dealing with it. I just, as a challenge, I'd like to put that up, but thanks. Yeah. Super. 
Can I ask you a question about yeah. the the development of the of the typology for buildings, and particularly yeah. residential buildings? Yeah. Um, and I'll make an observation, not to do with Hong Kong, but it comes back to Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, we were. I was privileged to to live in Malaysia, mm. um, in a colonial house. Now, the the colonial development of Malaysia and Singapore is is middle to late nineteenth century, rather than the dates you're talking about. Singapore was um, earlier, actually. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The um the the typology there for the residential houses comes really from the civil service that was de deposited on Malaysia to build, but it was noticeable that the 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 singles the bungalows for the officials um were two story. Mm. They would have a certain amount of resident of um, reception rooms on the ground floor, mm. but there was always a reception room on the first floor. Mm. And the reason I believe that to believe, and it was usually over the port cochere, there was a, mm. a reception room on top. And that was because the it was believed, and I believe it was true, that the, the, the range of the mosquito wouldn't go higher than four meters. Wow. And therefore they could live in uh, in a relatively mosquito-free environment um, on the first floor. Now, what I see on your illustrations there, mm. and you see the go-downs, and presumably in the go-downs, there is the merchant's accommodation above. That's right. And you showed the uh, image of this Chinese merchant's go-down right. with obviously his residential accommodation on top. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there isn't there an unselfconscious response to the business of the mosquito not getting above four meters? Uh, I, I would say um, uh, it, uh, quite possibly. I, I don't know. I haven't found evidence to say it one way or the other, except that you're right in saying that very early on, Hong Kong, Hong Kong buildings of the wealthy were almost immediately two-story, yeah. not one. Uh, not three. Three for the very wealthy, like Dent and Co., uh, and um, Gib, Gib Livingston and Co. Mm. and people like that, uh, and of course Jardy Matheson. But um, but but um, but in terms of building, yeah, I I do think I think think this two two level thing where storage is at the bottom, living is above, was a very standard thing in Canton as well. Yeah, but Macau, that made, yeah, it made and had influences in a security thing. Uh, I think it possibly is. I think it's more. Yeah, I think it's. It's to do with security. It's also to do with comfort. Mm. But we do know that the merchants had their rooms, their private rooms and bedrooms and things on the upper floor in, in the 13 factories. Mm. If you look at it, I didn't show this, but if you look at one of the maps in the book of the 13 factories, the roof system goes way out. It's like super long, deep, thin factories. Factory didn't mean manufacture at the time, but it meant run by a factor, which was an East India Company term. We see it in India as well. And they're long and thin, and they had little corridors weaving in and out with courtyards dropping through them and light wells. So these were dense, deep things. And, and I suspect that um, I'm not quite sure. Hong Kong was quite narrow. That Hong Kong was a shallow development of buildings, very different than the deep buildings that they were used to in Canton. But, but I think that the two-story thing was about comfort, access to light, um, and certainly cooler you know, it's cross ventilation and cross ventilation. So that there must have been many things, mosquito possibly, but it did seem like the mosquito w was very able to get to the second floor. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I'm only saying Hong that but story. it may also be yeah. that the air movement would mm. deter the, the mosquito. Quite possibly, yes, yes. Same thing when you have height, is that there's more airflow, probably. Yeah. But I, I had a question just on the back of that in yeah. terms of. What's happening on the river? Just in, you know, I would imagine there's a lot of people living in boats on the river. On Victoria Harbour. Um, the harbour, you mean? Just in, um, like, not British uh, yeah, yeah. folks, but I, I would imagine there is a population yeah. of people living on the water, yes. right? Yeah. And um, what, what's the situation there in terms of, uh, is, is there kind of standing water versus moving water? What's the air? Is there sort of... Um, Thinking, writing, concern um, is that different from? So that if it's the Victoria Harbour, you mean it's 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 a flowing yeah. part of the ocean, if you like, coming through, 
Uh, and yes, there must be eddies that are slower than others because the north side of the harbour towards Kowloon, the Timsad Sway side, was deeper. We know that. And the sh shallowest side was south. So all the deeper vessels were moored to the north. The shallow side had little clippers and little vessels going back. So most of the south had been um, concentrated Chinese vessels. There would be Chinese mooring. The, the, the figures of the Tonka people were particularly important because the Tonka were a um, ethnic group, self-identified ethnic group for two centuries, since the 18th century, by royal protocol, they were not allowed to live on land by the emperor. And so they uh, became these mercantile allies of the British and the Europeans, as you know, and they, they were doing an awful lot of horse trading, trading with small goods and stuff. And so they were ferrying people, they were moving stuff around, they were doing deals, they were, they were living on the waters. And so you'd have a lot of tanka all around the, the, the closest edge of the island. I wanted to, you just remind me one thing I want to just touch on, uh, to come back to your question. That map I showed in 1843, the Edwards de Havilland survey, and I mentioned it in the book briefly, but I want to em em emphasize a lot of these colonial maps deliberately withhold information as much as show it. We have no idea of the Chinese settlements on this map, exactly. but they are cluttered with map sheds. They are what because they were being perceived as shanty towns or dubbed as illegal structures. They then are erased from the cartography. Mm -hmm. And it's just as important to try to understand, even if you can't do it literally, but to do it imaginatively, that what that, from other evidence or senses, what the island was like. And it's also important to hear the island, smell the island in, from texts. How did it sound? How did it, the dynamite blowing up and the, the noise of, of crickets, the noise of rats dropping onto your head at night? I've got evidence for all that. And it's just fascinating, bamboo beaters at night to keep you awake for security. I think this is all interesting. Yeah. 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 Just out of curiosity, was yeah. there was the in, the incidence of uh, fevers among the Tanka people? Was it high? Is there any sense of like was there concern that? Oh, we, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't know for sure. We have mm -hmm. collective evidence of Chinese mortality, but we don't. It's not passed out into ethnicities. Right, yeah. um, there are scholars working on uh, the Tanka population at this very early time, um, and um, um, I know. Of, a historian in, in Hong Kong who's working on tanka and markets and stuff. And so this is being explored. Uh, so there is literature, there is some sources, and it's something I'd love to talk more about and find more about. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. I have two questions online and then we can go back to the room. So keep mm. your thinking hats on. Um, so one of the first questions from Sarah D um, says, Thank you for a very interesting talk, etc. Is there <laughs> Any suggestion that traditional Chinese medicine had um, theories for what caused malaria other mm -hmm. than miasma theories? Very good question. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I do know that Chinese theory at the time uh, shared similar attitudes towards miasma theory. Uh, and pretty much everyone thought, because miasma theory is far older even than Greek medicine, but we know the earliest records we think we have is from the Greeks of what caused, um, or of the ideas of miasma. But it was shared, Chinese believed in miasmas too. Um, so I don't know. I mean, what I can say is that I'm fascinated by the ideas of, for example, the, the idea of, say, the pagoda being like an acupuncture needle, because the idea is that pagodas were often placed in the worst sites of the most diseased or sites with poor chi, but it was considered to be the, the, the poorest perhaps you could say in the south of, of, of China, the feng shui, the, the worst areas were often had to be um, dealt with by reorientation of buildings, rerouting of water. Uh, the big, building of pagodas um, were, were sort of exercised um, the evil from the land through the spike that went through the pagoda. Um, so um, so the, the idea, these ideas of, of a sort of the, the body of landscape being a body is fascinating. And, and the sickening of bodies, affecting the sickening of populations on the bodies, landscape bodies. Um, so, so Chinese medicine looks at the inner surface of the body, but 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 the Chinese treated building as a form of external medicine too. So it all depends on the lens of what you mean by medicine, I think. But yeah. 
Thank you. It's a good question, though. Um, we have one more question, which um, you've already touched on in some sense, um, but it was it's from Iris, and she asks, which paintings or images in your book um, is most memorable um, and meaningful, and why? <laughs> it's putting you on the spot. <laughs> Well, having gone through all this, I've kind of forgot. I've, they're all a blur now. I don't. It's probably definitely for you. It's a um, the most interesting paintings that uh, affect me. Oh, I use them in conversation with each other, so I can't say that. What I mean, the cover, for example, has always haunted me from the very beginning, and it took me ages to find the um, the license owner of that image because the painting. I don't know, but the painting was uh, has gone back into private ownership, but the image was uh, the the image was taken at the time when it was owned by Richard Castle's family, the Castle Fine Arts, who generously uh, allowed us to use the image. And um, I I saw this in a book called Trade Paintings. It was called um, Taipan Traders in a nineteen eighties publication by Form Asia, which was always a very good publisher of Hong Kong stuff. Um, beautiful old prints and drawings and stuff and nostalgic. And um, that image haunted me ever since. And I think there was a whole debate about what would be on the cover. And in the end, it just won out hands down. And so I suppose that image has haunted me. Um, so yeah, that's as good an answer as anything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more thoughts from the room? Um, in front of Ellen. <laughs> So, uh, Chris, I was um, wondering about a methodological question. Um, mm -hmm. The time period is this got sort of eight, obviously very intense years in in a way. And I know that your other work on the military cantonments is over a much wider time span. And my own, work, we we often discussed our work together and, um, on India on civil civilian spaces and which is also over a very long arc. Uh, partly, I, I kind of use the argument, I think you two did too, uh, that you know, architecture takes time to change and yeah. over a period of time, one can map it. Uh, certain kind of mapping, one kind of needs that bigger time arc, temporal arc. But yours is also really interesting, this sort of intense eight, eight year period when a lot is happening. So I kind of wanted to know met also methodologically what it meant. What what were you were you looking at? Like every sliver of information <laughs> possible on that. Yes, actually. Thanks, Tanya. Um yeah, I I I it's really interesting. Uh, it is an interesting I've thought about this question because methodologically, when you think of time frame and geographies to space space, as you say, the kinds of conversations of evidence change dramatically. Uh, when I get around to writing that book on Indian cantonments, um, it will be a very different book because um, uh, the conversations will be much more condensed into um, descriptive and um, summative evidence compared to here where the evidence is almost like breezy. There's a lot of conversations, a lot of quotes, a lot of, a lot of dialogue going on because you almost on the ground. There's a sort of reportage quality to the book that I didn't expect would happen, but 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 it, it moves from different kinds of genres to from a slightly novel-like quality to then an analytical study and then back into a, a narrative that's very much, you know, uh, uh, counter thrust and counter thrust between certain agents on the ground, and 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 then newspaper articles and so the evidence is evidence in terms of textual evidence starts to really talk a lot and and I did try to find I did had no idea how how the chapters would fall what themes to focus on I just like hoovered up as everything I could and then what what it said formed clusters and then they started to coalesce I mean I literally photocopied loads of stuff very old school and I stuck them in envelopes and I put sticky stickies on, on them and moved themes around and, and absorbed them and played with them and, and started to reconnect them. And, and so in a way, I, I allowed the material to tell me how to place it together. And, and, and so, yeah, it came out of that kind of 
intensity yeah it, it it just was just everything i could find because you can that's the lucky thing it's it's early the colonial office records for example is just new so they don't have each year is is digestible instead of massive volumes on each year as the decades go on government documents get fatter and fatter as you know so so it was really a, a real joy and luck luxury to be able to go across as much as you could um and that's that was the outcome of this thank you tanya um thank you for the wonderful talk um just I'm yeah. just a bit curious about uh, the Zi Yun Tang collection where you source these wonderful archival materials. For. Yes. Uh, would you mind kind of introducing it a bit more? Well, that's all owned by Mr. Anthony Hardy, right? So uh, who set up the Maritime Museum in Hong Kong. Um, I, I mean, I can't introduce it a bit more. I mean, I mean, in the sense that uh, there are catalogues written. Um, I've forgotten his name, the scholar who who is the guru of the Tsian Teng collection. He's he's written two at least two books on it, um, who works closely with Mr. Hardy. But um it's all um the 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 collection is split into different kinds of types because it also includes Chinese art, figurative um art and now a porcelain uh stonework, I believe. Um but if you take away the way that and just look at the painterly art, that in itself is split into different types. They're uh, heavily trade painting focus, although they're portraiture. Uh, there's different loca locales of focus from Canton paintings to Macau paintings to Hong Kong paintings to paintings of ships, clippers, and tea clippers and things like that, which were, which were considered almost like you'd see George Stubbs painting the side of a horse. Well, in the walls of, of of a merchant in Hong Kong, they'd have the side profile of a, their favourite ship, which was just as uh, uh, amorous for them as as a horse. So, because the ship was 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 their object of 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 trade, but it was also beautiful, a sign of power and beauty and prestige. So you'd see um, ship paintings, you'd see um, 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 site paintings, you'd see a lot of paintings of the Canton factories, often burning. I think they burnt down the famous two burnings were, I think if I get the years right, 18, 1822 and 1842. It might be, I might be getting 24 and 44. I can't remember, but they're in 20 year interval. And um, there, there was all sorts of stuff. So, so that collection is very, very good in terms of, of information on Hong Kong, but you know that already by sense. <laughs> you don't. Okay. You're welcome. Um, thank you so much, Chris. And also just to say a big thank you to all of you for uh, for being here. And the conversation hasn't really ended. We're just going over to the next room. We can continue over a glass of wine or water. Um, so th thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.